I will talk today about uh, the selected issues in Norwegian geophysical prospection and some of the geological approaches that we chose to face these issues. Um, I will start with a graph that I took from actually an article of Gustafsson and Stamnes in 2014. And they, they wrote about the geophysical prospection and its development in Norway. And as you can see, um, as you can see, there's a steep increase in the last 10 to 15 years in geophysical prospection in the total surveys. When you look at the next graph, then you see that in the same uh, amount of uh, range of time, we also have an increase of uh, the methods used. So first, we only have, or almost only have, magnetometry. Now we have GPR uh, Earth resistance. Uh, last, the number of geophysical techniques used in one survey is still almost three quarters are made up of one technique. Um, that might be the reason, or one of the reasons why geophysical prospection had a very bad start in Norway. So for a long time, um, archaeologists that were uh, had the task to, ex to excavate had problems with using geophysical, geophysical prospection because it didn't bring the results that we're expecting. We've heard an example of this still today, and this is why it hasn't been used um, largely. Um, some of that is probably caused by technical issues, and Norway is a very wet country, and we have experienced that firsthand. Um, if it rains very much, then um, it's uh, very likely that you get stuck in mud. And at a certain point of time, you are in free, and you also freeze. Um, however, I think, in my opinion, the, the reason for these problems with geophysical perspective in Norway is the environmental settings. Norway has a very um, dynamic environmental history, very diverse settings. And it is it's, it, well largely shaped today, or its land uh, geomorphology, geomorphology is shaped by the last glaciation, deglaciation, which resulted in post glacial rebound. So as the ice masses melted, the land uh, started to upheave, and that's still ongoing today. And um, this is a time animation of one of our service, survey areas in Gokstad, where you can see how much ground actually was covered by the sea within 6,000 years, and how much has. Uh, been, or how much area has surfaced. And of course, the result of this is that it's mainly, um, the, the, the land is mainly covered by marine sediments around the coasts. So that's fine grain, silts, and uh, clays. Uh, another issue that we see is uh, unsorted glacial sediments, glacial outwash. This is uh, the green stripers, uh, the terminal, end, uh, terminal moraine, Ra, which runs uh, northeast to southwest through or, or above our survey area. And of course, um, these unsorted glacial materials, uh, uh, boulders of varying sizes, boulders of different rock types, and that definitely creates some noise in our day. If we go further back uh, in time, then we have to consider geology as well. Our survey area, Vestfold, here is in the Oslo Rift, and that means that we have a lot of plutonic volcanic rocks. Um, and that can be granites, monsonite, quartz monsonite, uh, larvae, leptide, and some of them are uh, made up to up to 1% of magnetite. And that, of course, is really bad if you want to conduct uh, magnet uh, magnetic surveys. This is just to further support this. This is a, a, a map from the, uh, is an aeromagnetic survey map from the Norwegian Geological Unit, and you can see here again in this area the high values, uh, magnetic values that the battery produces. So coming to our survey area, in the last five years, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute has conducted uh, extensive uh, geophysical service together with its Norwegian partners, the Westport Fulkus Kommune and the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Research, NIKU. And in these four or five to six years, actually, we've con collected quite considerable um, experience with the issues that come up in geophysical perspective in Norway. The total area that we surveyed is uh, up to four square kilometers of GPR and almost five uh, square kilometers of uh, magnetometry. And those are um, basically 
um, yeah, divided up onto famous Viking Age landscapes, among them some uh, which you will probably see tomorrow on your excursion, that's Bora, Oseberg, Boxstad, Kaupang. That's uh, the Oseberg Mount, this is the area we surveyed. That's Boxstad with Boxstad Mount, and that's Kaupang. In Kaupang we have conducted extensive surveys of the hinterland. So why were why why were we more or less successful maybe compared to other or earlier uh, surveys? I think one of the crucial points is that we use complementary methods, not just one but always two. In some in certain cases, selected areas. So of course, with the magnetometry, you can survey more area, and then it can later come back with the GPR and survey survey selected areas. Uh, we did large scale high resolution, which means extensive areas, um, but at a very high resolution. And that was possible because we used grid free positioning systems. So we could do a large amount of area in a reasonable amount of time. And last but not least, the data processing. We, um, we put considerable effort in processing our data. It's not just um, the, the, the false processing, but really. Uh, processing that is or was um, uh, targeted for the, the issues we face, and one of the examples for this is, um, for example, the Kaubang area. The Kaubang area is famous because it's considered, or was considered, until recently, Norway, Norway's first town. And the problem is that the settlement area is exactly here where shallow magnetic bedrock surfaces, and of course, it's um, uh, covered or masked by large bipole uh, anomalies. And if you use the, the correct filter, in this case a Wallace filter, and different windows, then we can reduce these problems considerably. So just as an example of how uh, complementary methods can be of use, this is the GPR data, and of course we see much more than we see in the magnetometry. So I would like to come to uh, the examples I spoke of before. Um, selected cases that we came across during our interpretations, during our surveys. And um, two of these are located in Goxta. Uh, one is in Bergmanby, and another one up in the north in Sunday. So the first, one of the first problems or troubles we faced in, I think back in 2011 or 12, um, we detected, or we, we, we were faced with limited detectability in the magnet magnetometry data sets. It's something we've heard today repeatedly. Um, again, that's uh, in Goxta. Goxta was, uh, was surveyed in 2011 and 12 in the framework of the Goxta Revitalized Project of the Cultural Her Heritage Museum in Oslo. And we discovered the Viking Age settlement and the cemetery in this area, 500 meters south of the Goxta Mount. And the problem was that in the GPR, in this rectangular, you can see quite faintly these so-called building plots. Um, but when we go to the correspondent magnetometry data, we see almost nothing. The only thing you can see here is a modern disturbance from drainage systems. Um, you can see it in more detail. So again, here are the faint ditches of these building plots believed to have held, uh, held um, little houses for trading or workshops. That's the GPR interpretation. And when you look at the magnetic data, you can almost see nothing. That's the only faint trace you might see if you want to. We were lucky that in 2012, the museum conducted uh, um, an exploration. And the GPR uh, results were really matched perfectly. Um, and that gave me the possibility to go there and conduct in situ magnetic susceptibility in order to uh, investigate the soils a bit more. I got a lot of help from my colleague Rebecca Connell, and um, this is what we came up with. Uh, so actually after removal of topsoil, the magnetic susceptibility meter could pick up in situ a difference, a contrast between these building plots and the actual sterile subsoil. Um, here again, a bit more in detail, it matches perfectly. This is really what we see is really these building plots. Um, however, we saw that there is really low, overall low magnetic susceptibility, really low. What we also did was we took cores from the profiles because we had a suspicion that the topsoil had a hand in, in this problem. 
and also pharmacological features within the trench. And what we saw was, again, very low values, and we, had, we saw a lot of these peaks in the top soil. And um, this, therefore, our conclusion was that because the soil there is very wet, we have repeated cycles of wetting and drying, because the soils here are stagnant soils. Stagnant soils means that there is um, a water, a zone that prevents the rainwater from draining. So every time it rains, the entire body fills up with water, dries out again. And this is a mechanism that ferrogenetic minerals, the minerals that are mainly responsible for our contrast, don't like. So they don't get formed or, or either they get destroyed. So our conclusion was that there is um, a combination of variation, noise in the topsoil, together with, with a loss of depletion of iron oxides that leads to this non-show non in, in the metabolism. <coughs> However, we thought we need more data. We wanted to know about the natural background signal in this area. And again, luckily, we were allowed to dig a profile just about one, one kilometer uh, to the east of, of um, the, the Viking Age settlement. And again, here this is the soil cover. You can see in turquoise these stagnant soils, so they're really quite common, especially in the lowlands, where um, the, the sea has been retreated last, so they, they were exposed last. This is where our profile was, and we could conduct this in the course of the topsoil stripping uh, conducted by the Westwood Food Movement. We made sure that we had a sterile profile, so no archaeology intended. Of course, there was archaeology somewhere in the middle, very small. However, we can see that the stratification is quite simple topsoil, subsoil, and a strikingly different marine sediment. This is the results we came up with. We conducted in situ maxas and lab based maxas. And something that you see immediately is that in the in-situ measurements, we see again this variation um, while, while, while we don't see them in the lab-based results. And that led us to the conclusion that these peaks are actually created by the glacial outwash or fragments of magnetic bedrock. They're included into the soil, and those are the ones that create these peaks. And that, in turn, creates a very noisy background, which is not favorable for us. And something else we saw, the marine sediment um, actually shows to be the highest uh, magnetic susceptibility value. And normally you would see that in the topsoil. This is like a, a Labornia effect. But in this case, not. And we think that this comes from uh, the formation of ferromagnetic iron sulfides. And this can happen in certain conditions, certain marsh conditions with certain chemicals present. Um, so you can imagine that a very noisy topsoil together with a, with a, with a very strong uh, under, underground basically is not very favorable to detect <coughs> very weakly magnetic archaeological features. So coming to another case that we were puzzled about was again, is again magnetic bedrock, I've already said that. Um, it's a problem sometimes when large areas are masked by these bipolar anomalies. We have um, other difficulties, and that's a okay, case study from the south, from Aspia. Um, and what you can see here is a magnetometry data set. And when we look at um, the thing in more detail, then again, we have a lot of magnetic anomalies. When I see that in Austria, I'm, I'm absolutely sure this is archaeologically, this, these are pits, we might have a settlement or else. But in this case, we're suspicious of the sheer number of these anomalies. And that's why we decided to dig a test bit. And as we had already anticipated, that's not archaeology, that's geology, that's uh, bolus, magnetic bolus in this case. This is an orange photo. Those are our stones. And if I compare it to the, to the GPR and I see that first we cannot see them in the GPR, so we cannot really identify them based on the GPR, and secondly, second, uh, it creates a lot of noise. And that's one of the reasons why our GPR data, that the background is sometimes very heterogeneous. When we compare it against magnetic data, then something else becomes very apparent, and that's um, the problem that we cannot simply establish an amplitude strength for uh, differentiating geological polars from archaeological pits because those are different kind of rock types with different magnetic values or magnetic susceptibility values. 
um, with different variable content. And it also depends on their size, their position, and their depth, the depth of the, on which they're buried, and all that basically contributes to how well we see them. So what we do at the moment is try to get samples from them as much as possible, sample the rock types, um, but also do magnetic susceptibility value uh, measurements in order to get more data on how we can define parameters <coughs> which will help us to differentiate them. One of, uh, what you can see here again is this variation in topsoil, um, and after the topsoil has been removed, we see much more clearly. So this is clearly a problem, as we have seen in the, in the previous case. Something we will do that is still work in progress is trying to um, analyze the magnetic signature of these, of these anomalies. So look, really looking at the amplitude values and, and see if we can define um, a certain pattern that we can follow uh, in order to, to um, understand and differentiate these things better. My last case is a very short one and it's not very true archaeologically at first. It's the, the case of the heterogeneous background that we that we see very often in, in Norway and that's because of the marine sediments. And for this we're going up to the north to Sunland. And this is actually a time size animation of um, a field we've driven one or two years ago. And what you can see here is a very striking, very striking pattern. And that's actually uh, beach deposits. Finely laminated beach deposits of varying grain size. And this is what causes this uh, absorbing and reflecting properties. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, GPR interpretation. For those of you who are not, this is where the archaeology is hidden in this field. If we look at that in more detail, then we see at least three burial mounds, very, very shadowy, but you can see how disturbing the background is, and it's really difficult sometimes to see them. So one, one uh, solution we come up, came up with to, to um, sidetrack this problem is volume rendering, and that means that we visualize our GPR datasets in 3D and we can assign certain amplitude values, certain colors, and we can basically um, turn off certain amplitude values. And, why these anomalies are created or the features are created, we have to, in order to prevent what we've heard today in the first talk, that archaeologists who use our data lose confidence in them and then abandon them altogether. So there are more questions uh, to be analyzed. And for this, we need to take into consideration the environmental settings. That also means geological evaluation. That means going out into the field. That means coring. That means being at excavations, being annoying, trying to sample whatever is possible. We need to understand the limitations. We need to get them across to archaeologists. Like Manuel has said before, this is not a one-man weapon. It's not. We, we don't scan the ground and we know everything that's there. We actually see when there is enough contrast and. I think to abandon it altogether would really be a loss. So we really should avoid it. And a, a way to avoid this development is really to work on the, the, the groundbreaking research to us what actually happens when we scan and what are the sources of our moments and features. And for that, of course, we need more systematic research. What you have seen, this is something I have done more or less at the site of our surveys um, because we in Norway and our research group were very interested in this. And, um, but I think we really need to, to focus on that and, and, and raise the awareness that this has to be done. Yeah, that's the references I've used. And um, the Botswana Institute, of course, is not acting alone, but is a framework of a lot of research institutions. Thank you very much.